There's something so interesting about e-commerce stores created by influencers where they almost don't give two shits about design and quality of design. They just like, they get some shitty Shopify template and they just slap their pictures up and it's go time. Is there a world where franchising works for D2C brands? Yeah, that is a great question. So you basically, you're saying, hey, look, why isn't Tar- why aren't Target and Walmart in all of these categories making private label products? Nick, you and I always talk about 3PLs and our poor experience with them. I want to talk about one that people are having a really good experience with. It's called Red Stag Fulfillment. It's owned and operated by e-commerce entrepreneurs. They're spectacular. They have three guarantees, zero shrink, zero mispacks, zero misshipments. In 2024, year to date, they have 99.993% accuracy across inbound, inventory, order accuracy, and on-time shipping. That's 99.993% that I actually blows my mind. If you want to learn more, go to redstag.com slash limited. Once again, that's redstag.com slash limited. Okay, Moyes, we are back. Season eight, episode five. We're both wearing the same thing as last week. Is that a coincidence? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, um, All right. So today um, we've got kind of a fun agenda. I was trying to think like what, what to talk about. Um, for those who are listening, Moyes and I texted that he would do one episode's entire agenda and I would do the other. And I always feel weird pressure in that situation because I feel like you always come up with the better topics or you just have cooler topics. But, um, I've got three, I've got, I've got actually four, uh, but I think we'll probably, or five, but I think we'll get through three. Um, so do you want to start with private label? or a TikTok brand, or um, kind of the shift from uh, D2C brands, or yeah, I guess like brands is uh, when we were working on them to more like how Gen Z is treated D2C brands. Uh, TikTok brands. Okay. So there's a TikTok brand that um, has kind of emerged. It emerged during the same time as COVID. Um, It's called Halara, H-A-L-A-R-A. And, you know, like the, the women that listen to this are probably going to laugh because they're going to be like, you know, how have you guys not heard of this brand? This is everywhere. For the record, I've heard of it um, and have always kind of been fascinated by them, but really just dove into their story recently. So essentially it's a comfortable, fast fashion athleisure brand, um, which, you know, the founder is, I think based in Singapore or uh, that's at least where their headquarters is. She sort of saw that athleisure as a category was booming during COVID, but all of the main options here, you think of Lululemon or Aloe or Viore, were pretty overpriced, uh, or maybe not overpriced, but like just expensive in general. And her whole goal was how do we make the same type of stuff at with the Sheen model, fast fashion, quick designs, get things out quickly, high margin, um, I don't know if they have warehouses here or if they ship directly to the US like Sheen does to take advantage of those tax savings, but I would assume they do. Um, but you know, this is a category that's growing at about 9% year over year. And what's interesting is kind of how they grew. So they mainly leverage influencers and customer content, which is something we were talking about last episode about you know how do you grow that TikTok channel? And that that's really where they grew a lot. So they, they basically, as influencers and customers would post, their whole goal was to take paid dollars and spark those posts. So initially, they wouldn't really go out and be like, hey, this is our ad campaign, and these are our evergreen ads. They would just say, okay, who, who has posted about us recently that you know their post did well because they were authentically talking about it? And how do we go pay them so that we can light their ad up and push that to even more millions of people? And they totally dominated the organic social game. They got, uh, I don't know when this stat was pulled, but over 10 billion views on TikTok and 50 million views on YouTube, which is pretty much unheard of. Like even I think Aritzia is way less than that, even though they've been around for a much longer time, have a bigger brand presence. Um, On Instagram, they have about 2 million followers and they average 10 to 20,000 likes which is huge because you see a ton of brands on Instagram, like even Hintwater, I think has 
50 or 100,000, but like, you know, they get 30 likes per post. And so it's like, there's real engagement here on TikTok. They, um, they have a lot of followers, but they don't get a lot of views. And however, their customer videos, like if, if you search Halara or Halara dress, the videos that are produced by customers, those have millions of views, you know, anywhere from half a million to 3 million views on some of the larger side ones. So then I started to think like, okay, these guys are, you know, very similar to like a celebrity brand in the sense that they have this huge coverage of eyeballs and impressions and interest. How do they capitalize on this on the shop side? So one big sales channel for them is TikTok shop where um, I don't remember exactly what it was, but I did read that they either, you know, they were constantly like, they're on the list of top TikTok shop products sold uh, or biggest, um, you know, vendor sellers on TikTok shop. Um, they've sold hundreds of thousands of units just from what I've seen of a variety of SKUs from their dresses to their leggings to their shorts. And that's just from looking at their shop and seeing the number of units sold. Um, many of their products have thousands of reviews on TikTok shop itself. So those, wow. I don't believe those are directly just pulled from their site. I think these are separate. And then the other thing that I thought was fascinating, and maybe I just hadn't seen it before, but I saw it last night, was they actually had stats around shop performance. So TikTok pulls this in. It's very similar to, I'd imagine, like Facebook's page rating or page score. Like, you know how you get your business manager you could see your page score, like how well is your brand basically perceived or, or loved by other people. You know, if you're serving annoying ads or uh, if you don't ship sure. your product on time, then they ding you. So under their shop performance, uh, products that have, or out of their reviews, how many reviews are four or five stars? That was 83%, which I thought was solid. Um, out of their orders, TikTok reviews? Is that what you mean? Uh, the TikTok yeah. reviews? Okay. Yeah. That does sound solid. Out of their, uh, so the second one was uh, ships within 48 hours, and they had 92% of orders shipped within 48 hours, which is pretty impressive. And then uh, responds within 24 hours was 99%. And I would imagine that that probably has the biggest impact to like how TikTok thinks about um, placement of your shop or like how well they favor your shop, kind of like the equivalent in Facebook ads of like, are they going to give you a high CPM because they're not a fan of what you're doing or a low CPM because you're doing everything right and you know you have good content? And I feel like that for TikTok shop is probably the response within 24 hours because I've seen that on the, on the vendor side. That's something that they also push in the onboarding. Um, so That's interesting. So you think that like there's this thing that it's supposedly in like China what happens is if you have bad credit, you can't like stay at nice hotels or get on fast trains. Like you, basically everything is hampered. All your ability to like live a normal life is hampered if you have bad credit or if like, you know, you're basically defaulted on a lot of loans. I don't know if that's true or not, or if I'm just like reading headline articles on Wall Street Journal and Reddit that are, you know, racist, um, but it could be either of them. But I feel like that's what TikTok does in some ways where they're like, okay, great. Uh, you didn't ship this out fast enough. We're going to ding your reputation. Okay. You yeah. responded to a customer quickly. We're going to improve your reputation. They're like, Everything that you could, pop, they're building a Klarna score for every single merchant Cloud and score. saying, okay, this is a good merchant to deal with. This is not. I'm sorry. What, isn't it Klarna? Wasn't Klarna like the cloud management? What was it called? Not right. Klarna. Clout. Clout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Clout. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. They're building a cloud score. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And like even similarly on Facebook, um, you know, I always remember like if there, if I spent uh, you know, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. responding to every single comment on every single ad for that day at Hint, our next day of Facebook performance would be better because, uh, you know, like this, the it was just a better day of performance. If we wouldn't respond to ads the day before, the next day was just not good. Like it was just, they would totally favor people responding to everything and, uh, and also it's like from an engagement standpoint, you know, if you respond, you get them to respond again, like you're just adding more engagement to all your stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with that. I just don't know if it's because you you're engaging with it or because you've deleted all the negative ones. <laughs> oh, that's a good question. Well, technically, um, you're like, cause now you've done like, there's 12 fewer hours of like, I hate 
Nick Sharma and Hint Water <laughs> yeah. uh, as like the top comment on all the ads. <laughs> So I think I, I I'm not saying that I'm saying obviously yeah, yeah, one yeah. as a joke, but like I I don't I honestly don't know if it's because you're doing a good job engaging with people or because you're deleting everything. I really that's don't a good know. question. That's a good question. And as a result, I think that if you're spending twenty thousand dollars a day on Facebook, you probably want somebody looking at your Facebook ad comments every two hours to make sure that you're doing a good job engaging people and like removing bad comments. Yeah, I think actually when we got to that 20k a day threshold is when I had hired somebody full time whose entire job was comment moderation. Um, yeah, it makes sense. Okay, so then so then I thought, all right, TikTok shop is obviously a lot of sales, but it's not their only channel. And so what is um, you know, like what what do they do on their site that is also so different? First off, just from, you know how similar web numbers tend to be, I don't know, anywhere from like 15 to 40% lower than what the actual site traffic is. What would you guess the similar web number is for their site visits per month? Um, hmm, past fashion. Uh, do we have any ideas? Like, I've never heard of the brand. All I know is they have 2 million Instagram followers. So I'm going to say a million seven a month, but I've got no, like, you know, I don't know anything about the revenue. This is the first time I've heard of their brand. So I'm just completely guessing. Okay. You're not terribly off for context. Um, Fashion Nova is at 22 million and Sheen is at 30 million. Halara is at uh, four and a half million. So I would imagine they're probably, let's just say wow. around 7 million is my guess. And um, wow, that's a ton. It's a ton of traffic. So the thing the the thing I love about sites that have a shit ton of traffic is you know one one improvement to their site that goes up 0.1% in conversion rate is millions of dollars in revenue. And um so I started going yep. through and thinking okay what is it that these guys do like how do these guys maximize and you know you just know these guys have zero shame. And so all right so I took a few notes. So when you arrive on the site <laughs> It has a spin the wheel, which, you know, all of us I in America, that. you go to a Shopify site and you got to spin the wheel. The difference is the copy on the spin the wheel tells you that there's a hundred percent guarantee that you're going to win something. It doesn't tell you what you're going to win, whether it's a discount or a $5 coupon or a free product, but it tells you that there's a hundred percent guarantee, which is fascinating. Uh, and I believe- yep. I've spun it three times. I've won the same thing each time. What did you win? Was it the headband? Uh, yeah, exactly. Okay, that's what I kept winning too. A hundred percent of people will win a headband. <laughs> that's really what it should say. <laughs> so I got the but headband. Yeah, I'm with you. Think about how many emails they're collecting yeah. with that. Like the incremental hundred percent guarantee to win messaging. I, I I have to imagine that's like you know that probably takes their opt in from like it's huge seven percent to I don't know twelve percent. Like it has to be huge. Yeah, um, it's huge. Okay, yeah, so then I that's a good line. Yeah, really good line. So then I get a free headband and the CTA that I clicked was view bag because what a great CTA. And so I click click on that and I go to a cart, which I was actually surprised to see that their cart was not a slide out cart. It was a separate cart page, which is generally not my best practice, but right above it was add on deals at the top. And they dis they had discounted products with strike through prices, and you could one click add these products. So you'd click this pair of shorts, immediate pop up. You choose color, size, add, and you know instead of um, it basically tells you like it's twenty three dollars, but crossed out next to it is forty dollars. And there's a little thing once you add it to yeah. your cart that says you have to add sixty dollars more of product to get this deal. So to get the deal that takes you from forty dollars to twenty three, you have to add another sixty dollars worth of product. Which I thought, one, my, my first thought was like, wow, that's fucking genius because you just added another reason for me to go. Like, it's not that you're just giving me free shipping. Pay more, or, buy more. Yeah. I mean, the cogs on their shorts of what, like a dollar maybe, if that, at their scale. And so they also then, uh, it's it's just another reason to go and add more things where it's not a mystery gift where I'm like, if I add things, then maybe I'll see what I'm getting. But it's just like, hey, if you do this, we're going to give you this. It's like they're almost just basically giving you a fair trade. My second thought was like, is this confusing for the average person? But like there's no way these guys would be doing it if it was confusing and it didn't work. 
You know, what's interesting is there, oh, it's almost like, let's say you get 20% off if you spend a hundred dollars or more Yeah, and you add an item for $20 to your cart, they're showing you $16 and they're like, add 84 more dollars to get this price. They're showing you there's a discount applied, even though you haven't hit the threshold is really what Oh it. yeah, exactly. Which is that. really clever. Yeah. Does that make sense? Totally makes yeah. sense. They're like, okay, great. Here's the discount you'd get if you hit the threshold. Yeah, that is fascinating. Another another interesting thing that they do um, that as soon as I saw this, like it reminded me of your native cart where you had the coupon code, but uh, their version of yeah. of the Moyes coupon code in the cart was calling out the subtotal and the saved. So when you have something in your cart and it's a strike through price, it actually separately calls out in a different color how much money you're saving in this current it's order. Saved. That is really interesting. Um, then right below that is another like merchandise section, uh, which says you may also like, and um, it's got a bunch of other products that, you know, like whatever uh, it, it's either a, and I don't know this cause I'm not a female shopper, but it's either a, they don't have enough skew. Uh, they, they only focus on a certain number of SKUs or they know the take rate on certain SKUs is much higher. So they, merchandise it that way, or B, based on whatever I had in my cart, those shorts, then it, it gave me recommendations that uh, they know have sure. a high take rate based on what's in the cart. I'd imagine it's the latter. But this you may also like section has other products below that are bundled. So it's like, it'll show me leggings and it'll say, you know, three for two or buy two for 49 instead of one, you know, one is like 34 95 or something. So I thought that was also fascinating because it's like, not only did they above where the items are pitch you on getting a discounted product, but right below, they're going to hit you with a different version of the same thing. But like from a messaging standpoint, the way they convey it, it feels like it's a different offer entirely, even though it's the same type of thing. Um, and lastly was, I went, I went throughout their site also. I didn't find anything else that was that great. Obviously their site speed is super fast, but um, they did have a really cool... Yeah. Thing on the PDP or not super cool, but like, you know, basically buy more and unlock free gifts as a result. So on top of all the discounts that are in the cart, yeah. they don't, they don't message those same discounts on the PDP. The messaging is separate so that I'm assuming you don't get confused, but on the PDP, they tell you, Hey, if you spend 79 bucks, we're going to give you a free keychain, which, you know, the cogs got to be like a nickel on that. If you spend 139 bucks, you get like a crossbody or waist bag. If you spend one seventy nine, you get a free gym bag, which obviously, if you're us, you think mm. of that and you're like, "What a margin play!" But to the average person, they're probably like, yeah. "You know, oh, I'm at sixty seven dollars. Well, if I spend twelve more, you know, I'm so close to getting the keychain." I wonder how they figured out those pricing thresholds. If it was like, you know, let's find our three most common AOVs and let's do something that is, I don't know, twelve percent above our three most common AOVs and let's put the gifts there to get people over that hump. Yeah, that's a great question. I'm not sure how they uh, figure that out either. Uh, Amazon does something like this, actually. If you go to, if you buy groceries on Amazon, you know, they started charging for shipping and they give you a discount on shipping based on, if you get over, if you spend over a hundred dollars, you're, uh, you get free shipping. But if you don't, like there's reduced tiers, like get over 50 and I think it's like 695 over a hundred is free. And they'll be like, you know, you're this far away from free shipping on all, whenever you add something to your cart. Obvi does something well, I think interesting as well, which is like, the more you add, they're like, this is how far mm. you are from a free gift. Like, okay, you added, you know, this much, you added this much in your cart already. So you're this far away from a free gift. I think that's really good. Th this site does seem incredible. The prices also seem in, like, you know, I'm a little worried, like, you know, last episode we talked about fads versus sustainable businesses. You know, I wonder, is this business around 10 years from now, basically, because everywhere I go, there's they're throwing, like, you know, when you load the site, yes, there's the wheel, but there's also a thing that says, do you want push notifications from the site mm -hmm. like coming from your Chrome browser? And then afterwards, it's like, give us your tech, give us your phone number for 25% off so you can get texts. And then those, uh, like, you know, if you don't do this wheel, there's a little free gift thing. Like, there's a lot being thrown at you at any given time. But I agree, the discounts to increase AOV are insanely are such a good idea for these guys because you're right. The goods cost them 50 cents. The biggest thing that their biggest cost is going to be shipping. So they want, they want to be able to fill up that box and they're doing a really good job of that. Yeah. Here are a couple of things. Like I, I also love that they have a sticky add to cart button mm -hmm. or add to bag button on the checkout page. They have a sticky, you know, continue the checkout page button. A couple of things I don't love. And I'm, I'd be curious to get your opinion on this. One is it you, it's an endless scroll. You can always scroll down and see more items. 
which is so frustrating to me because sometimes I'm trying to get to the footer to click your Instagram uh, yeah. like link or your about us link, and I can never get there because it's constantly scrolling. What what do you like? You know, does that do you see that a lot or you don't see that a lot? Um, no, I don't see that uh, a lot. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm also not a fan because I'm the same way. Like a lot of times, I just want to go to their Instagram or their TikTok and just see see that. Like I just want to see what that is. Yeah. And you can't do that with an endless footer. The other thing I really like on their PDPs is like that easy return policy shipping to the United States. Like this is when it's going to ship and this is when you can expect it. Um, I really, I really like those, uh, that, that type of information on a PDP like this. That's great. Um, they're obviously leveraging like, um, renderings for like their model will have, be wearing one that I'm looking at a skirt or skirt, I guess. And, uh, you know, anytime I switch colors, basically the model doesn't move. The skirt just changes colors. And so they're just rendering it. Mm -hmm. And that's a really good job. Like, you know, it's a really good job of rendering it and like saving a lot of cost that way. The other interesting thing I saw was on their checkout page. And I'm just playing around with it right now while you were talking about it is when you click checkout, the first thing you're met with is a very clear enter your email address right here. It's almost like they're so worried that you're going to get away from like their abandoned, car- like they want to get you onto their abandoned cart flow almost more than I think they want the purchase. They're like, please enter your email address right here. Like you can't see all Ooh. the other fields that you want to fill out just yet until you do this abandoned cart thing and you click, you agree to see, re- you agree to receive marketing emails from us. And that second box is unchecked, which is surprising. You agree to receive marketing emails is unchecked on their checkout page, which blows my mind. I can't imagine why it would be unchecked. Um, but a very, very interesting site, uh, and insane that they have 5 million unique, uh, 5 million visitors a month. And I've never heard of it. Yeah. Uh, Makes me realize what, like, I don't know anything about this industry. <laughs> Nick, you and I always talk about our poor experience with 3PLs. I want to talk about a 3PL that people are actually having a great experience with. It's called the Red Stag Fulfillment. It's owned and operated by e-commerce entrepreneurs. It's not VC backed. And the crazy part is they don't say yes to everybody like every other 3PL. They say no to most people. They won't work with you if you're an apparel company or a company with thousands of different SKUs. Their goal is to provide the best fulfillment experience for brands where Red Stag Fulfillment and you are a mutual fit, which is really amazing. They're backed by three performance guarantees, zero shrink, zero mispacks, zero misshipments. If they miss one of those guarantees, they fix it at no cost to you, and they pay you $50 per instance for the inconvenience. So if you're doing a million or two million a year, Red Stag Fulfillment's probably not for you, but if you're doing three, four, or five, you should really reach out to them. You can go to redstag.com slash limited to learn more. Once again, that's redstag.com slash limited. A couple other thoughts that I thought were cool. One is, um, so their homepage. Um, so, okay, so actually, if you're on a product page, you uh, don't see, or actually, no, that's not true. Um, if you're on their homepage, they don't have their logo in the center. It's on the very left side, which, and I think on mobile, it's non-existent, which I thought was interesting because on the other pages, it is existent. But I think a lot, they probably saw that a lot of people look at the logo, like they click the logo just to go to the homepage. And if you're already on the homepage, then why distract somebody again? I thought that was interesting. Another one was on their homepage, they actually have like an explore tab, um, which is interesting too, because it's like, it's basically an opportunity for them to just show uh, show off their products or sort of like educate people on what their products are. Um this explore page also leverages a good amount of UGC, which I thought was interesting. So one of the other cool things is if you click around their site, like whether you click on the dresses from their homepage in the nav bar or halfway down the page, if you look in your URL bar, they're basically identifying exactly where you're clicking from and where you're going to. And I'm sure that gets reported into some system that then clearly shows, you know, here are the most common user paths or Customers who come from Meta are acting this way and TikTok are acting this way. Um, and, you know, they can probably use that a lot to their advantage. That's so good. Yeah, that is really good on how to build like flows and be like, what, where did customers go? I've also never seen this. This isn't like related. This isn't related really, but they have got, they've got like the registered trademark R in a circle in the URL. Have you ever seen that in the past? Uh, no. Where do you see that? Uh, I'm going to put it in our chat right here. Like there's an R 
uh, which doesn't show up in this link actually, but in my uh, right after Cloudful on my URL bar, there's a little R with it, like a circle around it to say like oh, it's wow. a registered mark, which I'm like, I've never seen that in the URL. Yeah, interesting. Never seen that either. Um, so anyway, so that's Halara. And I just thought it's a really fascinating story. Um, and it actually inspired another, the next part, which is kind of the shift of like, the D 2 C brands, you know, when I think of when you think of like old school D 2 C brands, you think Everlane, Bonobos, Native, Warby Parker, and the way that a lot of these brands grew um, was basically coming to market in a very loud way, uh, running ads, and basically just slowly taking over a market, like one one impression at a time, and. Um, it was always like you come in and, you know, at least companies like Everlane or Warby, it was like come in, do a huge campaign. And then, you know, once this big campaign is out, then you launch a bunch, like Away is probably a great example. Huge campaigns about travel. And then they come in with, you know, more performance ads and just slowly eat market share one impression at a time. But this new like wave of these Gen Z focused, uh, you know, digitally native brands where um you know companies like topicals or crown affair or um another one that i saw or that i'm a huge fan of is strawberry milk mob have you heard of that one whoever whoever listens to this and uh knows that brand is going to giggle but um you know it's ba basically like what these brands did is they they built a very niche audience for their product and then and then slowly validated it and then kind of grew it within a niche before going to more of the retail side. Like Crown Affair, it, you know, they they built this – they, I think, did one of the best jobs. They built this incredible brand, um, and it felt like it was a big fish in a small pond in terms of within its own niche. And then all of a sudden, they're at Sephora Nationwide. Or, Crown um, Affair? Is that, I'm sorry, were you talking about Crown Affair? Yeah. Have you heard of that brand? Yeah, I have. Yeah. Um, this other one that I went super deep on, uh, is, is strawberry milk mob. And I thought it was really interesting because a lot of these brands, like they kind of start by really just creating content. And, um, you know, so this brand was started in 2018 and the founder had this mission statement of making cute bikinis at cute prices, but she was never really able to get the sales to take off. And so then she ended up turning to content and created a TikTok account two years ago and tried to start making content there. That also didn't work. And then she pivoted to this more lifestyle approach of content where, you know, like she would, she had this series of like reason, reason number 42, why I love men. And it would be like, you know, whenever the uh, gas is below a quarter tank, like I come back the next morning and it's already full, or it might just be something that makes fun of them, makes fun of us. Like, you know, uh, reason 47 why I love men, whenever I go to the bathroom, you know, the toilet seat's already up and it makes me get my hands dirty trying to put it down. Like it's, it's either funny, it's f always funny, but it's like, that was kind of the, the, um, format. And it basically followed this like very old school Gary V playbook of, you know, in some way she is adding value cause she's making you laugh, but you do it in a way where this person then ends up wanting to go and see what the, what this person is about or what are they selling or what's their deal. And, um, and it worked so well for them. Their brands started to slowly take off. And then she basically realized that with her content model, she should create, or with her content play, she should be running these bikinis in a drop model. And as of today, uh, you know, those apps where it's like, you can go and see, how much sales a Shopify store is doing, and they have their own way of figuring it out. According to that type of software, she's doing when she does drop days, she does anywhere between seventy to one hundred thousand dollars in a day. Doesn't run any ads. Um, it's all on Instagram and TikTok. I don't even know. I actually, I, I think I just signed up last night to the newsletter, so I'm not sure like what their newsletter is. But like their website is a very basic Shopify theme with some plugin that has a crazy banner on the top with a timer. And it's nothing fancy, but it got me to think that, um, you know, there really is no excuse. If you've got a good product, there's no excuse why you can't get it out there. And it also made me think like the, the prior way of 
selling things or, you know, it used to be that like whoever has the audience always has the leverage. And with the way these platforms are shifting, I think it is whoever is the best at creating content will be the one with the leverage and will end up winning. So how much do you think Strawberry Milk Bob does in a year? Well, the estimates I saw on that, that Shopify thing was probably like eight to 10 million a year. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, that, that sounds right. I, I would guess that's still actually a little bit high just going through this site because I'm like, okay, there's, it's so ridiculously unoptimized. There's no call to action button on the hero image. I'm not sure if you saw this, but on the cart page, like the checkout button is really low. It says, please check your address and items in your cart before purchasing. Blueberry can't, I don't know what Blueberry even is. Blueberry can't make changes after you place the order. You guys, double check, triple check. Who cannot make changes after you place the order? What's going on here? <laughs> like, what's the problem? You don't like, huh? Like, like I'm a, like, what? So Blueberry and I think Coconut are like the the character names for her sisters. So her name is Georgia. And then she's got two sisters. One of them goes by Blueberry, I think. And one of them goes by Coconut. I think that's right. Okay. Somebody okay. is definitely I'm laughing listening to this. Okay. And why can't Blueberry make any changes after you place it? What does Blueberry do then? What's her job? There's drops. <laughs> there's no customer service. Oh, there's no ads. What is Blueberry's job then? Well, okay, that's yeah. I'm not sure. Do, do you know Danny Duncan, YouTuber? No. So, okay, so no. Danny's a YouTuber, and um, so we've been friends for probably seven or eight years now, and I've seen his own merch line grow. Go to DannyDuncan69.com. Yep. I'll, I'll text you yeah. the link so you have it. No, I'm there already. And um, okay, guess guess how much revenue this site uh, probably does in a single year? I've been on it for about five minutes or for about five seconds, but I don't know, 10 million bucks? Yeah, probably around double that is my guess. Um, there's something so interesting about like br uh, e-commerce stores created by influencers where they almost don't give two shits about design and quality of design they just like, they get some shitty Shopify template and they just slap their pictures up and it's go time. It is really amazing. Yeah. I, I do admire that this woman is like double check, triple check LMA of like laughing my ass off, you know, just check. Like that is really interesting. There's a great, you know, like, um, like there was these uh, brothers that graduated college. Uh, you know, I used to watch a lot more basketball than I do today, but like uh, their father was, his, he's like, I'm starting a brand called Big Baller. And he's like, um, my son could beat Michael Jordan. And he was just, and so one guy, he's starting this brand called Big Baller and he was selling like shoes and jackets. And one guy was like, hey, I ordered my jacket or I ordered my shoes and I, it's, it's been a month, they haven't been delivered. And, and the customer service was, I guess you're not baller enough then. Like it wasn't like, oh, our bad. Here's a tracking number. It was the fault is on you. You're not a baller enough. And I'm like, yeah. okay, th this is kind of awesome, but kind of outrageous. So I, I do appreciate like the, you know, um, the kitschy, the kitschy nature of these things. Yeah. I wonder like, you know, going back to our last episode, I wonder for them too, is like, is this a fad or is this like, is, is this something where they're going to have to transition now into that more mature type of brand that, you know, has lasting power. Yeah. Yeah. I think often influencers, like the first way they monetize, sometimes they're like, we don't know how to monetize. And so an easy way to do that is to be like, let's have merch or a store, something to link to mm -hmm. where basically someone can give us their credit card number and get something. Um, I think this is like, you know, I, I'm sure this isn't the only way Danny Duncan monetizes. I'm sure he has better ways than this or more other ways than this. Uh, but I feel like this is, a, this makes a lot of sense. I, I get why you do this. Totally. Okay. Last thing I want to talk about is um, private label brands. So um, how, how friendly are, or how, how much do you like the world of private label brands? I love the world of private label brands. Okay. Amazing. So in the last basically two years, uh, Walmart, for at least from what I've seen, Walmart's made a huge push on celebrity brands. Lots of our Sharma clients who are celebrity brands, whether it's Feastables or Chamberlain Coffee or Blocks, uh, they're all in Walmart doors nationwide and with open arms from Walmart. And along with their other efforts, these brands bring so much new foot traffic into their stores, which is why Walmart has become obsessed with celebrity brands. Um, a big part of their game with 
you know, hot deals or like hot brands like this is that Walmart is probably hoping that you're going to come in for a Feastables bar, but you're going to leave with a cart valued at, you know, 47 bucks on the way out. And so then you think, okay, what do these retail channels have um, baked in that all these D2C brands don't? Uh, and, and when I say retail channel, I mean like, uh, really like Walmart, and that's margin. Like they they know that when they sell something for four dollars, they're buying it for two or two fifty. Um, and what do all these D two C brands have that retailers now are obsessed with and want? That's loyalty. And so, I believe that's one of the reasons why so many of these retailers have started to build their own private label brands, in addition to, of course, the margin savings that come. But you know, Trader Joe's, Walmart, Target. Uh, Costco and Kirkland Signature, Aldi's, Amazon, they all benefit from their private label brands. And of course, the revenue that comes from it. Trader Joe's even employs their retail equivalent product to make 85% of their store sales. So like they don't produce anything themselves. They just go to the same equivalent and get it done. Costco does it too. Like Costco vodka is actually Grey Goose vodka, even though, uh, although for them, most of their membership or most of their revenue just comes from membership fees. But um, Walmart just launched their biggest new private label brand in 20 years. Did you see this? Yeah, I did. So it's called Better Goods. And right off the bat, I love that it's it's spelled lowercase and it's grammatically incorrect. It's one word instead of two. Um, they launched 300 items, mostly around five bucks, but up to 15 bucks across multiple categories, frozen, dairy, snacks, beverages, pasta, soups, coffee, chocolate, and more. They also have uh, six other, or a ton, but you know, six that I thought were recognizable. Other private label brands, Great Value, Members Mark, Market Side, Freshness Guaranteed, Old Roy, and Parents Choice. And um, I started to think like more around the world of private label brands, and um, and for some reason, it also kind of gives me a similar vibe to or. Like it puts me in the same thinking space as like, is there a world where franchising works for D to C brands? So then I started digging more into the world of private label and basically into the grocery category, about 25% of products are sold private label in snacks. It's about 10% and beauty and personal care is seven and a half percent. So then I was thinking like, what would work well for private label and what wouldn't work well for private label? I thought like what wouldn't work well would be consumables, anything that's like, you know, uh, your kids like Tums or maybe it's like uh, Sudafed. Like, I don't know that. Well, I guess Sudafed, like you get a lot of private label, but I thought for some reason, consumables might not be up there. Um, another one was art and musical instruments. And the other one was beauty. Although, um, although I think beauty could maybe cross over. But then I started to think what, like what could Target and Walmart make from a private label standpoint. And I'm curious to get your thoughts. The few that I thought of, one was in the sports space. Like, I don't know why we're selling Wilson basketballs or Penn tennis balls. Those should all be, you know, private label. The other one I thought was camping and outdoor gear. So like tents, beach towels, you know, those fire starter logs. Like, I don't know why those aren't private label yet. Um, supplements was another one, like generic supplements, you know, whether it's your greens powder, colostrum powder, vitamin C, vitamin D, whatever. Um, major appliances, like if you walk into Best Buy, half the store is now appliances. Like why is there not a version of a fridge or an oven or an air fryer that Best Buy sells that, you know, if you've got a community of 250 track homes that you just go in and you get private label appliances, like I don't think they're going to mind. And then the last one I thought of, which you brought up on the last episode is Stanley Cups. Like why isn't Target made their own version of the Stanley Cup? to appeal to people who get maybe priced out of like the original Stanley cup. Sure. Sure. Um, yeah, that is a great question. So you basically, you're saying, Hey, look, why isn't target, why aren't target and Walmart in all of these categories making private label products? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, a, I, uh, I think that's a great question. Um, and in fact, let me write something down cause I want to bring it up later on, which is, um, consignment. Uh, but, um, Ooh. you know, I think they are in some of them. So I've seen equate, uh, you know, uh, you know, equate competitors to like Centrum Silver and Centrum. Like the, I think they are in the older categories. I, and I think in the past people have done this, like, you know, Sears, have you heard of, uh, Kenmore appliances? Have you ever heard of the brand Kenmore? Yeah. Kenmore was the in-house brand for Sears. Like that's how, that's what Kenmore was. 
and it became such a big brand that it became bigger than Sears at some point. And they're like, okay, let's spin this out and let it be on its own and sell it everywhere. So I, I think in the past, people have played around with this. I think the reason that they're not in like basketballs is there probably just isn't enough volume there. Like they're probably I like, mm. but may, you know what? Like it is a little bit silly because oh, I say there isn't a lot of volume, but let's say let's say Target sells a hundred million dollars of basketballs a year. You know, you private label that, and you probably went from making ten million to twenty five million. Certainly worth the time of like two people or three people that you hire to manage a supply chain of like the Target basketball. Um, so why don't you just go ahead and do that? So I think there is some. Uh, I think there's a lot of truth to what you're saying. Um, I think the I think the 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 reasons against it would be one like is it worth the effort like is that fifteen million dollars important to target maybe not um, and the other thing that the other reason against it is at what point do you piss off the brands like at what point are you like mm-hmm. anyone who comes in I compete with so quickly where you're like like Aldi like no one's at Aldi because Aldi is just like private label Trader Joe's is mostly private label not to say they wouldn't go in there I'm just curious like at what point are people like this is a private label shop. Uh, but what I, if, I think like, that Target and Walmart are far from that. I think Target and Walmart should be doing a bunch of more, uh, like probably should be doing a lot more products. Like when when you were pitching Native, were you ever worried that these guys would come out with their own private label version? And like, how did you think about that? I was certain that like Walmart already had a private label version and they were saying compared to, like, you know, it said compared to Native deodorant. I remember my father was like, you made it. Like you have a Walmart knockoff. <laughs> um, and so, um, you know, I, like I, I, you, that's where your brand comes in. Like, if your brand has a, a, the ability to pull in the dollars that uh, you can get because people are like, "I want this product in particular," you win. And if you, like, you know, if you don't, you don't. Like, for instance, Charmin. Do you want? Like, Charmin is a great. Like, you know, there's a million toilet paper brands. Charmin is like, look, we're softer and more plies and like, you know, friendlier than everybody else. Are you ready to pay the premium? for that softness and that brand, or do you not care? Bounty like has a really good paper towel. Are you willing to pay the premium? And like, you know, the great part about like Bounty and George Charmin is like no one, you know, in your house, people sort of know if you have th- like cheap soap when they go to your bathroom, right? But no one knows mm-hmm. if you're using Bounty paper towels. It's not like, okay, it's really obvious until you really start touching it. So I think that like, um, there is that opportunity, but I think if you're a brand, you're just like, I have to live like this. Like that's, that's how it works. But my brand needs to be strong enough that people are willing to make the trade up for it. Like for instance, I wouldn't want to go buy fake Oreos. Cause like, I'm like, I know what I'm getting with Oreos. And I, if I want an Oreo, I want an Oreo. I don't want the cheap version where it's not going to be as good, but I felt like I saved 25 cents. So I think like Oreo solved it. They're like, yes, there's a fake one. Do you want the good one or the fake one? Yeah. It's so interesting to like, as you say that, it's like, wow, that's so obvious, but it's something you never think about before, especially like with the bounty or the Charmin concept. I mean, they're CMOs. Like if you were to ask them, what is your number one goal? I bet it would be like to synonymize Charmin with soft. Like that's probably the only thing they care about. So that when you hit the the aisle for that, all you think about is, oh, but that one's soft. So I'm going to go with that one. Yes. Yeah, 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 that's right. In fact, like Dove used to own the, or Dove owns like the lotion space. When you think of a bar soap from Dove, you get moisturization because they always have that drop of like cream making it white and beautiful and like moisturized. Um, And so like, yes, I I think you're right about that. Let me ask you another question about brick and mortar stores, which uh, is not on our agenda. Why is there, um, why does Walmart buy goods? If I were Walmart and I was like, yeah, I want like, hey, Chamberlain Coffee, do you want to come here? Great. We'll we'll pay you for your goods when customers come and buy them. Why are we going to put up all this money up front to buy from you? Who needs Chamberlain Coffee? Who needs each other more? Like in the Chamberlain Coffee slash slash Walmart space, who is the person with more leverage, Walmart or Chamberlain Coffee? It's Walmart. Like I I think Target could have come to me and been like, hey, look, um, we're going to put you in Target, but we're not going to pay you until you sell your products. Until your products start turning, like when there's a sale, we'll pay you. We keep your products on our shelf. We're not going to pay you a dollar for them. And when there's a sale, we'll pay you. We'll, we collect a $12 from the customer. We'll pay you your cut. Uh, like that's what Amazon does, right? It's like sold and shipped by, right. uh, like it's sold by you, shipped by Amazon. Amazon doesn't pay for your good. Once the item is sold, they give you some money, right? Um, I'm not, I, I'm shocked that Walmart and Target aren't using more of their leverage to be like, I'm going to let in the celebrity brand or I'm going to let in the startup, but yeah. only on the condition that it's consignment, that the good sits in my store. And uh, you, I only pay for it when it's sold. 
if if you were to be like if you were to put yourself in the Walmart shoes, like why do you think they don't do that? Is there any advantages around um you know, like would Procter and Gamble agree to do that? Like if you went to Tide Pods and you were like, we're only doing that. but I guess maybe it only works for like newer brands. I think with new, for, yeah, I think with P and G, they probably have a lot of like, uh, like they have less leverage than they do with like newer brands. But I think, and P and G actually has agreed to some terms where they're like, they get paid much faster than every other, everybody else, but they mm. offer a discount in order to get paid faster. So like there is, like, there's been a negotiation around P and G's like terms and everything. But like, you know, uh, like at Target, they're like, okay, well you, we need to like, you know, you send us a product and we'll pay you in 30 days or 60 days. I'd be like, mm-hmm. if this product doesn't sell, we're never going to pay you. It's just going to sit here. Why am I going to put all this cash up? We pay. Right. For, we're going to keep the cash. Uh, like, and when your good sells, we we give you the money. Until then, we're not going to give you any money. And if you're like, you know, Curie deodorant, don't you just say yes to that? Because you're like, I need to get into Walmart and totally. I need to get into Target. And so, I, and I'll go find the financing elsewhere. I'm shocked that Walmart and Target haven't done this. In fact, I would say no problem. I've set up my own financing department. Here's the you need to you need to finance your PO from Target. This guy, yeah, here's my finance us. department. They'll finance it for you. They'll pay you 60% of the price. You get paid 60% up front of what you would have if you need the money right now. Yeah. Wow. We should, yeah, we should try to get that answer. That's such an interesting question. I wonder why they don't do that. Yeah, me neither. I I, I don't know the answer. And I was thinking about that when I was walking around the other day and I was like, why are they giving anybody money? I'd be like, I fucking yeah. own 4,000 stores. I'm Walmart. I'm not going to give you $1 until 90 days after I sell your item. You I get the yeah, float from it. Why would you get the float? I would yeah, exactly. Like I would imagine how much it, it, there, there's got to be billions of dollars that is just tied up between we've paid for it but it's not sold yet. Yeah, yeah, billions of dollars at Walmart, billions of dollars at Target, and instead they could sit on their balance sheet, they could use it as a source of financing, they could put it in a bank and get interest on it. Like there's so many opportunities right. for these companies to do that. And yeah, you can't do it against Anheuser-Busch. But you can do it for the startup. Right. Totally. Interesting. All right. Well, that's all I've got for today. Um, awesome. That was great. Episode. Appreciate the agenda. Yeah. And um, yeah, we'll be back next week for episode six. Awesome. Thanks for tuning in. We'll be back next time to cut through the noise in CPG, retail, and e-commerce. And if you enjoyed this episode, then why not share it with a friend? And be sure to subscribe on whatever platform you listen to your podcasts on.